Now, Ask Dr. Love with psychotherapist, author, love and relationship expert, Jamie Turndorf, Ph.D. For expert advice on love and relationships, call into the show at 888-463-6748. That's 888-GO-FOR-IT. Or you can submit your question online at AskDrLove.com. Now, here's Dr. Love. Hello again, and welcome to Ask Dr. Love Radio. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf, and it's my pleasure to be with you today. And today I have a very interesting guest. His name is Charles Rawlings. He's a neurosurgeon, a lawyer, and author of the book, It Really Is That Complicated. And wait until you hear what he has to say about women, relationships, and I'll just let him speak for himself. Are you here? I am, yes, ma'am. Hello. Welcome to my show. Well, thank you very much. It's nice to be here. Yeah. You know, I was going to ask you, what led you to ask to be on my show? So I got a letter in the mail, in the an email, and it said, Dr. Rawlings wants to be on your show. So I was wondering why you picked me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I was going through some Facebook, and I was going through um, some websites, and I noticed you. You're... Your approach to many of the relationship problems and dilemmas and sexual questions uh, seems very intelligent, very modern, very calculated, and so I thought we might probably connect and click. All right. Well, let's just see about that. Let's just, <laughs> let's. let's just jump right in because, you know, I read every page of your book, and I know a lot of radio hosts don't do that. I didn't skim. I read every page. So <laughs> I, 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 so I'm not going to follow, you know, your publicist sent me interview questions 1 through 12. I'm not going to do that if it's okay with you. I'm just going to just jump right in with you, talk about the book, what I read, and go from there. Are you comfortable with that? I have no problem at all with that. Yeah, you wrote it, so you better be able to talk about it, right? <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So you start by saying all men are fixers, right? And you describe I, women as like a house. It's a fixer-upper project. Exactly. <laughs> right? And right? Um, Yeah, one of my friends came up with sort of that analogy. Um, men are fixers, or at least most of the alpha males. I mean, uh, and even, I think, to some extent, beta males, but particularly alpha males, and this is one of the problems, in fact, with male-female relationships, and I'll start with that and just as an example. Women come into a relationship or come home or go out with a male, and they start talking, and they start describing their day. They start somewhat, not, I won't say complaining, but, you know, describing their problems, describing uh, some of their their interactions, some, some perhaps... Uh, things that didn't go well for them. And the male is sitting there uh, almost always trying to fix it. It's like he's trying to come up with a fix because that's what males do. They want, they hear a problem, they hear you complain, and they say, well, let's just get a plan and let's fix it. All right. So I agree with you that the male gender role is instrumental or task-oriented. So they do tend to want to fix problems when a woman is pissing and moaning about what's not going right. He thinks it's his fault. Well, how did I do something to make you unhappy? What can I do to fix it? I agree with that. But I have to say, there are women who are fixers, too. You've seen the nurses, the caretakers, the rescuers. They're driven to choose guys who aren't only fixer-uppers, but major overhauls or really tear-downs. They should be tear-downs. <laughs> yeah, really. Well, you, know, you know what I'm talking about, the women who do all the heavy lifting. And to, from what I see, that the obsession with fixing is not a gender-driven phenomenon. It's a function of early childhood trauma because you're trying to fix a defective parent. Well, that is certainly one way to look at it. Um, I would probably give a little bit more of a specific answer to that. I've certainly been around plenty of nurses, and there are there are many nurses who go into their profession to save people or fix people. And I agree, it's probably based on a, an early childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. However, there are many of these nurses, many of these women who you would see as fixers who come into a relationship and they want to give that role away. They want to be able to come into the relationship and have someone else start fixing. That's true. 
That is true. But we all want to have a nice little um, mommy to nurse us, you know, one breast chocolate milk, one breast vanilla milk. You know, we just everybody wants to return to what Eric Fromm called return to a state of dependency. We all want to be taken care of. Right. Now, you also say in your book that women are concerned with security, children and the nest. Yeah. And that they just want to feel protected. Yeah. So now there is a you know, a biological deterministic aspect to this. I do agree with you that that we do want to know that a guy's not going to abandon us and our offspring, right? And we all want to feel protected. This is very, very true. Well, what do you think about the fact that now women can take care of themselves and don't need to be protected? I, I think, yeah, I, I think that you're absolutely correct, and I think that that is a a very positive aspect that women can become empowered and be independent and 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 run their own lives. But that also throws into the relationships a serious twist or a serious kink because with the women being independent, you have males who, if you want to, say are biologically coded, biologically wired to take over the the role of provider, the role of hunter, if you want to say it. And when they come with a, if they come upon an independent woman, their world is going to be turned upside down, and they're not necessarily going to know how to react to that or how to give the woman her space, how to honor and appreciate uh, that, that aspect of the woman. In fact, this very weekend, um, the, the woman that I'm actually starting to see now, we were in Sedona, and it was pointed out that it's sort of like in a relationship you have each other's back, but you have a separate life, and you're independent, and as long as you support each other's independence, then that's, that's the way the relationship should go. And, but a lot of males have a problem with that because they are, for want of a better word, hardwired from a biological standpoint to be the provider and to take over the role of a hunter. So let me ask you, is the woman you're seeing uh, an escort? No, she's not. No, we'll get into that in a little while because we we're, we're, we're just warming up. This is form, foreplay. you got to get comfortable before we slip it in, right? Uh, this isn't even foreplay. <laughs> All right. All righty. For that. <laughs> All right. So speaking of foreplay, you say a guy needs to feel needed in the bedroom, but he has to feel he's vital to a woman's achieving her orgasm. So if she uses toys during sex, you got to let him know that you need him to push the button and change the batteries. Uh, oh, honey, I couldn't do this without you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think it needs to be quite that specific. <laughs> he just doesn't need to be feel that he's been taken over by the toy, so to speak. Um, yep. But you know, toy, but you, know where, you know where macho women buy their vibrators. <laughs> Where's that? Black and Decker. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> That's funny. I like that. No, I never <laughs> thought of a black and decker as a vibrator, but that's yeah, really good. it's a power yeah. tool. So now you say all women want children. All women. Women want to nurture. So you think men don't? I think men are scared of having children. There are certain men that um, recognize the fact that they can be a nurturer, and and that's one of the more evolved type males. I think most men are deep down scared of children. They don't know how to handle them. They don't. They are not hardwired for them. Uh, it's fine if they go have some and interact with them, but they don't want to be, be on the day-to-day -day dealings with them. I kind of get the image of you holding it out in front of you like a thing. Here, you take it. <laughs> exactly. When something goes wrong with it, it's like, here, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll interact with it, but here, the rest of it's yours. Absolutely. So you you don't think a man has a nesting instinct, a want, a want to procreate? Or you just think he wants to spill his seed, um, disseminate his seed, but then what gets produced out of it, he leave it to the woman? Um, you know, from a hardwired biological perspective, that's the, way it, uh, that's the way it is. Or at least that's the way it's traditionally been taught. I don't think anything can be said specifically, you know, die hard ever, never. But I think for the most part, yes, that's correct. All right. So let's go on to this. The end of Chapter 1. I wrote this down. You said, in the next chapter, we're going to examine the psychodynamic horrors of marriage. So when I read that, I thought you were going to do some general 
expository discussion about marriage. But then cha- chapter two says a marriage of 18 years. So we're talking about your psychodynamic horrors. I wouldn't say that I specifically discuss my psychodynamic horrors. It is more of a general. But, you know, my marriage was 18 years. And it was, for the most part, was a fairly decent marriage. But uh, things change. And you just get, the marriage gets built upon uh, not communication, no communication, uh, your, your baggage, your blinders, your filters. And it just gradually breaks down under all the weight of it, yeah. So you think yours was a slow erosion? I think it was a slow erosion, yes. All right. So in this same chapter, you say all men, uh, and I do take ob- objection to whenever you say all, because as we know, all generalizations are false, including mine, right? <laughs> I, I would not argue with that. It's more, right. of a, more of a here readers. I would say all means the vast majority. How's that? All right. So you're saying men resist commitment because you say they're afraid that another better woman will come along. So it's kind of like a copulatory imperative or a biological drive to spread their seed to ensure the continuance of the species. And so um, I don't I don't want to just get tied down with one. What if a better better breeding um, sow comes along? That's kind of what you're saying. Well, I'm, I'm not necessarily sure I'm even looking at it from a quote in your words, breeding sow. Right. But, but they're hedging their bet. Right. They, they're. They're not sure that the one that they're picking, and it, it really is actually somewhat their own reluctance to rely upon their judgment. It's like, are, am I sure this is really what I want? Am I sure that my instincts are correct on this one? Well, uh, wait a minute. Wait. Now you, you say we're going to get to this. You say women don't want what they say they want. You're saying now men don't know what they want. That's what you're saying? No, they're just I, hedging I, their bets. Hedging your bets. Yeah, bets I mean, or beds. Yeah, and settling perhaps for something less, knowing that what they want, they may not obtain. Because now it's a self-esteem thing. Well, I really want a woman who's this great, but maybe I can't get her. So now I have to settle for um, the neighbor lady who um, has warts over her whole body. And, you know, oh, my gosh, now I'm going to close down my options. And what if the other lady does look my way? So... You see it as a very, um, it's almost like a business decision, you know, and you're making a calculation. It's almost like a business decision. And it's interesting that you open up the self-esteem angle because many times where people or men have problems committing, it is sort of a self-esteem issue. They're not, mm-hmm. su- they're not sure that they can live up to their part of the bargain. That's a nice way of looking at it. Now, you know, it is said that that because it is not natural for a man to enter into a state of monogamy, because this is the continuance of the species again, I'm supposed to impregnate as many females as I can so we continue the species. So it's not natural for me to be monogamous. Freud was saying this. I, he certainly wasn't the first to say it. So when a man is willing to give up his freedom and enter into monogamy, he has to feel that the woman he's choosing embodies the best of all women. So he makes the leap into marriage or committed relationship because she is all women rolled up into one. So I'm not giving up anything. I had every woman in her. And when a man feels that about a woman, he is very willing to make the leap. I absolutely agree with everything you just said. Well, damn, that's why they call me Dr. Love. (laughs) I'm going to take a brief break, and I'm going to be back with you in a moment on Ask Dr. Love Radio. You're listening to Ask Dr. Love with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. To speak to Dr. Turndorf live on the air, call 888-463-6748. That's 888-463-6748. If you like what you're hearing, you can learn about Dr. Turndorf's techniques for turning conflict into connection and healing in her critically acclaimed, groundbreaking book, Till Death Do Us Part, Unless I Kill You First, a step-by-step guide for resolving relationship conflict. Find out more about this book and read a free excerpt by visiting AskDrLove.com. This is Ask Dr. Love with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. And if you have a question for her, please call in now at 888-463-6748. This show is for you, the listeners, so please give her a call now. If you're a man who needs to lose up to 30 pounds or more, we have an important free offer for you. 
Sensa needs you to help us reach our goal of helping men lose 2 million pounds of unwanted weight. That's why we're giving away as many free 30-day trials of Sensa for Men as we can in the next 24 hours. If you're ready to lose weight and help us reach our 2 million pound goal, call for your free trial. But hurry, every 15 seconds, someone says yes to Sensa. So free trials are disappearing fast. To guarantee yours, call now. 1-800-923-6975. In a six-month study, one of the largest of its kind ever conducted, participants lost an average of 30 pounds using Sensa for Men. Now, you can too. The demand has been overwhelming. If you want to lose up to 30 pounds or more, call now for your free trial. 1-800-923-6975. Strict limit of one per household. Again, that's 1-800-923-6975. 1-800-923-6975. A tool for people to connect to. Now back to Ask Dr. Love with Jamie Turndorf, Ph.D. Once again, here's Dr. Love. Hello again and welcome back to Ask Dr. Love Radio. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf and I'm talking with my guest, Dr. Charles Rawlings, author of It Really Is That Complicated. And this is the time in the show where I do Dr. Love's quickies, but I decided... I don't want to do them today since we're so in the heat of this conversation that I think I just want to stay with you in the book. So let's just um, let me go to the next thing you talk about, about women being addicted to the chase. But then once they get a man, they don't want him. So why do you say that? Because the vast majority of of women that I have spoken to about the book, I have as friends, have, and other other women, just random folks that I've discussed, all all say that it's like you can't be too available, uh, you can't you can't treat them too nicely, which I know sounds very bad or pejorative, because they just lose interest. It's like this one's the easy one, and so maybe maybe he's too easy. Maybe I'm settling. Maybe I should go after someone who's more difficult. Um, there's also somewhat of a biological thought about this, is that women want someone who, in terms of, of, I guess, a descriptive statement is a bad boy because they're more likely to survive in a, a rough-and-tumble world, I suppose. Going back to early mankind, um, where the bad boy, the one with an attitude, was more likely to survive um, in a survival situation versus those who are meek and mild and are nice to women and actually can relate to them. Um, Mm -hmm. That's what you're saying. So, you know, it's funny, um, my husband, you know, I was married for almost 30 years, and we were crazy for each other, and he would fall into the category of a nice guy, absolutely a nice guy, and... He had brains, brains. Now, there's something adaptive about brains. You don't have to have brawn. In this world, brains can see you through. You can be an excellent protector and provider if you've got the brains to get you out of trouble. Right. There's tool use. Absolutely. Right, right, right. (laughs) So now, but also, you know, men want a chase, too, not just a woman. You know, women aren't the only ones addicted to a chase. Men love the thrill of the chase. They're hunters, right? They are. Right? And uh, they like to conquer elusive prey, right? They do. But the, when you get to a certain point in your development where you're past the game playing, you're past trying to uh, capture people who are unavailable because you're trying to work stuff out from your first family, then you are more able, developmentally mature enough to just move into a relationship where it's a give and take and you are mutually there for each other and you're not about the struggle, you're about the feeding of each other. Do you understand what I mean? I do. That's an evolved relationship. And yep. my point is that there are very few women, and in this case, as you would say, men, who are that evolved that can get into a relationship like that. They have to throw off their filters. They have to know themselves. And they have to be able to, as you would say, feed off each other 
and support each other. There are yes. very few people that are like that. It's gone, <laughs> that they've it's gotten true. over their childhood traumas and learned themselves. That's right. Well, when you say feed off each other, it kind of has a piranha association to me. <laughs> I knew as soon as I said that you were gonna You knew that. I was going to jump your bones on that one. I know. It's it's more of it's more of an energy transfer. Like, it's a feeding, um, a feeding of. It's like you're coming to the relationship saying, what can I do for you instead of what are you going to do for me? Absolutely. And that's the way you should approach the relationship is what can I do for you? I honor and I appreciate you. What can I do to help you? All right. So listen, listen, before I take a break, I just got to give you a couple of tweets because what show is complete without? Here's one. Old scars from childhood prevent us from forming a, an adult relationship that's good. And here's another one. Adult relationship tug of wars come from trying to settle old childhood scores. A misuse of power in and out of the bedroom spells relationship doom. And the last but not least, squabbles over power and control are going to put your relationship in a hole. All right. I'm going to take a little break. When I come back, I'm going to talk with you about what you say. All women want what they can't have. Be back with you in a moment on Ask Dr. Love Radio. You're listening to Ask Dr. Love with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. To speak to Dr. Turndorf live on the air, call 888-463-6748. That's 888-463-6748. If you like what you're hearing, you can learn about Dr. Turndorf's techniques for turning conflict into connection and healing in her critically acclaimed, groundbreaking book, Till Death Do Us Part, Unless I Kill You First, a step-by-step guide for resolving relationship conflict. Find out more about this book and read a free excerpt by visiting AskDrLove.com. This is Ask Dr. Love with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. And if you have a question for her, please call in now at 888-463-6748. This show is for you, the listeners, so please give her a call now. If you're a man who needs to lose up to 30 pounds or more, we have an important free offer for you. Sensa needs you to help us reach our goal of helping men lose 2 million pounds of unwanted weight. That's why we're giving away as many free 30-day trials of Sensa for Men as we can in the next 24 hours. If you're ready to lose weight and help us reach our 2 million pound goal, call for your free trial. But hurry, every 15 seconds, someone says yes to Sensa. So free trials are disappearing fast. To guarantee yours, call now. 1-800-923-6975. In a six-month study, one of the largest of its kind ever conducted, participants lost an average of 30 pounds using Sensa for Men. Now, you can too. The demand has been overwhelming. If you want to lose up to 30 pounds or more, call now for your free trial. 1-800-923-6975. Strict limit of one per household. Again, that's 1-800-923-6975. 1-800-923-6975. A tool for people to connect with the universe and begin to understand it. TalkZone.com, Internet Talk Radio. You're listening to Ask Dr. Love with Jamie Turndorf, Ph.D. Once again, here's Dr. Love. Welcome back to Ask Dr. Love Radio. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf. It's my pleasure to be with you. And I have my guest, Dr. Charles Rawlings, author of It Really Is That Complicated With Me. So listen, I said before I went to the break, I was going to talk about why all women want what they cannot have, according to you. But why don't we just jump into Chapter 4, just jump right into why you say all women are prostitutes. This is a really, uh, really intense uh, title, so go for it. Okay. Um, well... This chapter title evoked a lot of gnashing of teeth and, I wouldn't say anger, but just consternation in many of my female friends just because they see the word prostitution as a denigration of their femaleness or womanhood. And believe me, I have I have plenty of escort friends and even a couple who are clients who just, just bristled at that word. Uh, but, I mean, I used it and I left it there just because it was somewhat controversial and would catch people's eyes. Um, yeah, I would say that, that probably achieved your intended purpose. I would say it probably did, yes. I mean, you jumped right on it. Uh, I humped right on Oh, did I say humped right? Now, you say a nice date costs 450 bucks, but a good escort costs three to 400 an hour, and uh-huh. you're guaranteed to get laid. That's what you say, That's right? right. 
Absolutely. And that the goal of most guys is to just get laid. And that you're surprised that more guys don't seek out the circuit services of an escort. escort. Right. And I think the, I think many men do, and it's just somewhat secretive. Um, uh-huh. Was, so, were... so it's um, all about, you know, a cost-benefit analysis. It's cheaper. If I go, go with a, an escort, I can pay less and be sure of getting laid. And you also said that you're paying so that the escort will leave afterwards, which you don't get with a date. That's right, absolutely. Charming, charming. Well, it's true. <laughs> I mean, it, it, you can go on these dates that just turn out to be horrible, and you just can't get out of there fast enough. Whereas mm-hmm. with an escort, um, you know, for the most part, typically, um, once the once the time's up, they leave. Yeah. So, uh, so basically. It's all about physical satisfaction and how you can get it for the cheapest amount. So I have a caller on the line. I'm going to let Chester come in on this conversation. Come on in, Chester. Hi, I'm listening to this, and I'm really astonished at this conversation. This is amazing. Uh, uh-huh. What this person is talking about has absolutely nothing to do with what I'm interested in in finding a, a positive relationship. I don't find any of my relationships a form of mercantile um, I don't find uh, any of my relationships uh, something that I would ever trust if I ever paid for it. Um, it would immediately cancel out what I received if I had paid for something. To hire somebody to tell me that they like me or that they service me, I mean, to turn what I think is like an amazing, wonderful possibility in life into a product is just like absolutely not what I'm interested in. I can't believe anybody would say that. Mm-hmm. So what do you say to our caller? Well, I think that he's probably somewhat evolved, but many people see sex as a product, see sex as a duty. Um, and from a physical standpoint, it's easy to satisfy a male. They do not need an emotional connection. Whoa, from... whoa, 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 Dr. Love, uh, do- uh, sir. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I Break, think probably put the brakes on. You may need one. I don't know but... who you, you're talking Who in the world are you talking about, sir? I mean, with complete respect for your credentials, you've probably w- written a book that appeals to a lot of people. But where do you get off presuming to know what... People, what uh, making this assumption about what ha- the, uh, I mean, uh, that just steps on, uh, that steps on me, and I would imagine a lot of men, men who sincerely want to have a, a relationship based on trust and love and something that develops between people, and you, you can't possibly believe that you can. Ca- you, Equate those two kinds of things. There is no relationship between what you're talking about and what I'm seeking in life. No, there probably isn't. And uh, probably say, no, no. Get this straight, sir. With all due respect, <laughs> you have it completely blind. You have blinders on. You have no idea what people are all about. That's what you believe in. I hope it serves you well. But that would leave me high and dry, my friend. High and dry. Well, I appreciate that. Stay with us, Chester. It's nice to have a little uh, a little conversation here. So stay on the line. So because we're talking, this is um, an important important topic because, you know, you you asked to be on my show and they don't call me Doctor Love for nothing. So I'm gonna I'm just gonna take a leap here and um, suggest something to you, Doctor Rawlings, that that uh, was not introduced in the book. And when you say that um, all women are prostitutes, right, I think that you're talking about your mom because I read on page 44 that story you told about how your mom leached off your father. She didn't have an allowance. She spent on the family into debt, and they were in such debt that your dad had to come to you at age 14 to bail them out. And he couldn't do anything right in her eyes after you bailed the family out, and neither could any of her children. Now, when you say that all women are prostitutes, mom prostituted herself. She drove the family into the ground. And when you have a mom like that, you are pissed at her. You're pissed at a father for not standing up to her. And she was an absolute bottomless pit who could never have enough or be satisfied with what she had. Now, that early trauma is the author of your theories because your interpretations and your theories about women and relationships are filtered through that lens of your early trauma. Now, well, you don't talk about that in the book. 
No, that, but that's a very that's a very interesting point. Um, and mm-hmm. I would say that to some extent, you were or you were correct until I started seeing that and threw that filter off. And then you start looking around, and you're seeing this. I'm seeing the same dynamics. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Because here's where the haunting of our early traumas comes in. We do repetitions of our early traumas and we don't even know we're doing it. We choose people who keep playing the part of the parent we had difficulty with. So if you have a mother who was never satisfied, you're going to keep picking women like her who can never be satisfied, what you call women not wanting what they say they want. That's you. We, you're the common denominator. You pick these kinds of people again, again, and again. And then instead of saying, wow, why am I choosing these women? Why am I drawing them to me? You then make a theory and say, oh, this is how women are. No, this is your trauma talking. Dr. Turndorf? Yeah. Uh, this is Chester speaking. Uh, yeah. I, I just wanted, would you mind if I just chimed in here for, for a second? Please. I really feel compelled to say something in defense of Dr. Rowling's Go for it. Uh, I, I, I really feel that, uh, you know, somewhere along the line, it, my sense of you is that you've really been hurt. And when I hear you talk on the radio, when I've sort of looked up some of your stuff, um, your book and all that, and um, I hear somebody who's, who it seems to me, it sounds like you've gotten a, r- a really raw deal. And a lot Absolutely. of this stuff sounds to me like, like, like almost like a prenuptial. You know, there's like... It goes through this kind of almost legal negotiation between you and these girls, these women, these prostitutes, whoever they are. And uh, I, I really want to say that I have a, a strong feeling in favor of you. I feel like you've really been hurt, and mm. uh, it makes me feel really sad that you would that you would be in that position and that, that you would have to write a book that uh, that is presented mm. as a kind of defense of you. It's very, very mm. sad, sir. Mm. Did we lose you? No, 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 I'm no, not here. No, I, was, I thought he might have w- wanted to say anything else. No, I really, wanted, I really wanted to come to your defense because That's I, very I, sweet. I think that you've sincerely been been hurt, and I know maybe what Doctor Turndorf is saying is 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 spot on, but. You know, something's but really, Chester, really you, got to you and I'm very you're sorry. totally right on, you know, because when oh, we have the, we get we hurt ourselves over and over again by, you know, it's that haunting that I talk about until death do us part where we've been so hurt that we keep choosing people who hurt us in the same way we were hurt as kids. And then the, the it's adding salt to the wound and insult to injury. And you're absolutely picking that up, Chester. Uh-huh. It's, well, it's, I don't know, Doctor uh, Rowling. Do you think that there's any merit to this to this idea? I mean, what do you think? Um, I think everyone gets hurt emotionally as you go through life. I think it's right. how you deal with it. Right. And I mean, I appreciate your uh, you coming to my defense, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I've worked through not this. that you're I being attacked, sir, but I mean, age. That you're, you're just. I mean, it, this is kind of a there's a an insight here that I think is really important. Your book is. Is is very revealing uh, about you, sir. I mean, it is very revealing about you. I'm just hearing what you what your philosophy is, and my heart, you know, immediately goes out to you. I mean, you really must have been through some awful <laughs> stuff. Well, uh, let me ask you this: What do you think of prenuptial? Well, you know, uh, uh, if I'm going out, of, if I'm meeting somebody, <laughs> the first words out of my mouth are not going to be like. Hey, oh, by the way, I have this form here. You want, I want you to fill out all this stuff here, and I want protection because you. I mean, what does that say to somebody? It's not, no, no, it's no. It's something I, very I, negative. I it's not, not going to be your first thing, but say... It's a very negative communication. You know, when you get involved with people, or I mean, I don't mean to advise you. I mean, you guys are the experts, but my own personal experience is when I get involved uh, emotionally with people, I, I take a risk, and I don't think that there's any way i mean i could hire somebody to say the words i want i could uh co i could um uh, mediate with somebody to say the words i want but in the end if if there's if i put my thumb on it it's like sl- it's like slicing meat on a scale i want to see what i'm really getting and i don't want to have any i don't want to m- interfere with a person's response i don't want to lead the witness so to speak I want them to speak for themselves, and I want them to come from the heart. And I definitely do not want to have any prenuptial anything with anybody. You just come at me with who you are, and, you know, if 
if I love you, I love you for who you really are with clear vision. Sure, but, but do you know what I mean? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I, I'm, I get what you're saying. Do you right, think it, that it, you're it, taking it, a it, financial what, risk without a prenup? I'm just not interested in any strategies. And if somebody's going to work a strategy on me in romance, <laughs> I'm out the door, man. I'm gone. You know, there's that strategy. idea. The, the idea is, well, I can be protected. Well, yeah, you could be protected financially, perhaps, but the protection of your heart is not going to be afforded you by a prenuptial, that's for sure. I think you, you also uh, are, are reaffirming this idea that, uh, you know, protection relates so much to a sense of injury. And if you feel you need a prenuptial, then, goodness, you know, you must have a really good reason for it. You must be injured. And, and that's what my sense of you was, uh, Dr. Rowling, was that I hear, I hear a deep wound in what you're talking about, and my heart goes out for you. I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't want to deny you the protection that you deserve. If a prenuptial does that for you, great, I'm, I'm all in favor of it, but I don't feel that injury in my life. But you know, Chester, I'm sure you know, and I'm sure um, Dr. Rawlings knows too, that we are the authors of our own injury in the people that we choose. Because I read on page 12 of your book, and this really stuck out at me, when you described the story of when you proposed to your now ex-wife, who you'd been dating for years, and you asked her if you wanted to get married, and she said, to whom? And you went on to explain that you didn't run for the hills, but rather you decided to try to win her. And... When I saw that, I thought, man, this woman was not responsive to you any better than your mom was. Not responsive, didn't appreciate you, and this is how we repeat our trauma. We pick people who keep on disappointing us and not being satisfied and injuring us in the exact way we were injured as kids because we have a fantasy, this time around, I'm going to fix you. I'm going to give you so much love and money and things that you will come around and appreciate me and you'll be satisfied with me. And in the end, it does not work because we pick someone like the parent who couldn't be satisfied. And so we just end up feeling sucked dry and mistreated. And then we form theories like, well, I don't trust women or all women can't be satisfied or I need a prenuptial to protect myself. Instead of looking back at ourselves and saying, why do I keep picking this kind of person, what's my injury? How can I heal it? So, so you're against prenups? Oh, see, it's, it's, Chester, isn't it interesting that out of everything I said, he only focused on the prenup? Well, no, I mean, well, I, the, other, the other parts are all your opinions, and I'm not going to argue uh-huh. about that. Uh-huh. I'm just curious that, you know, a prenup is something there that can protect someone, and I use the word protect someone uh-huh. literally, from a financial aspect, uh-huh. the, the right. other stuff is is your emotional. Analysis. That's all that I, I'm worried I'm not about. Argue the with that because I, I agree with it. I you know, have yeah. a question about that. I should. I, I am going to get a, a copy of your, your book. I'm going to buy a copy and I am going to read it. It's very interesting what you're saying, uh, but I, I definitely do hear what you're saying about that need to uh, feel protected. And, mm-hmm. but, but sir, I don't. I don't think it comes from no place. I think it comes from some place. And I'd be curious whether uh, you've you've been married before, and whether perhaps you had uh, a marriage that uh, failed. Uh, is that true, sir? Sure, I've, I was married for eighteen years. I had okay, no so it does make sense. Again, I see how it can with. make sense. And, I absolutely uh, get it. What's that? I absolutely get it. I, I, I'm yeah. going to I'm going to buy your book, and I'm going to read it. And and I appreciate hearing you you uh, talk about it with uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Turndorf. Dr. Turndorf, I appreciate your program. A very interesting topic here, and it, but it it got me uh, when you're starting to talk about um, love for sale and uh, and and uh, that that bugged me because um, um, as a man, uh, as somebody who um, uh, feels that uh, he is a lover, um, I, I want it clear that uh, uh, that. Uh, that I, I just don't travel in those lines. and. Uh, but you I didn't have really... a mom. You didn't have a mom who spent the family into debt. You know, let me take a deep break. A, a deep break. <laughs> let me take a <laughs> short break. It's a deep break. And I'll be back. Stay with us, Chester, because I think right. that it's nice that you empathize with the male perspective here. We'll be back yeah. in a moment on Ask Dr. Love Radio. You're listening to Ask Dr. Love with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. To speak to Dr. Turndorf live on the air, call 888-463-6748. 
That's 888-463-6748. If you've recently been through a breakup and are looking for a second chance, wondering how you can reconcile with your ex, or if it's even possible after all you've been through, Dr. Turndorf's latest book, Make Up, Don't Break Up, presents her five-step plan for reconciling with your ex. This plan was developed out of years of research, working with thousands of couples at her Center for Emotional Communication. This is a proven no-hype and no-nonsense method that gets right to the root of the problem to guide you to the right path towards reigniting a lasting relationship. For more about Make Up, Don't Break Up, visit AskDrLove.com. This is an urgent message for all individuals with extremely large credit card debt. No matter how much you owe on your credit cards, the company that has settled more debt than anyone in the U.S. could settle your debt, too. While you make one low monthly program payment, you have the opportunity to hear how low your monthly program payment could be for free. This free information is available now simply by calling Freedom Debt Relief at 1-800-504-0243. I repeat, if you have extremely large credit card debt, you now have the ability to reduce your total debt and get one simple low monthly program payment. This could allow you to resolve your debt faster than you ever thought possible. But you should act quickly. Call Freedom Debt Relief now to learn how much you could save. 1-800-504-0243. Again, this life-changing information is available for free. To find out how much you may be able to save, call today. 1-800-504-0243. That's 1-800-504-0243. 1-800-504-0243. Beaming stimulating electrons directly to your cerebral cortex. There could be some side effects. This is TalkZone.com. You're listening to Ask Dr. Love with Jamie Turndorf, Ph.D. Once again, here's Dr. Love. Hello again, and welcome back to Ask Dr. Love Radio. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf. I'm talking with my guest, Dr. Charles Rawlings, author of It Really Is That Complicated. And I have a caller who's staying on the line. His name's Chester. So where were we before I took the break? We were talking about... uh, the. The prenuptial versus how we protect our hearts and minds and pocketbooks from being injured by uh, the same kind of vulturous partner uh, who replicates the parent that we grew up with. So, um, you know, Chester, you are obviously one of these evolved guys, clearly. Thank you, doctor. Yeah. So, um, and you were very, you're very kind to, um, to pick up on the pain. So, you know, when I talk about the pain that we all inflict upon ourselves as we are drawn to partners who are like the parents who hurt us, one of the most difficult places that we have to come to in being able to free ourselves is, I think Dr. Rawlings, you call it taking the filters off. I call it um, really stepping into the mouth of the lion and owning our feelings about our original experience with our parents. What did it feel like? How were we hurt? How angry were we? Because when you when you quoted at the head of the chapter about all women are prostitutes, you you quoted a, a line from H. L. Mencken. You said, "Love is the delusion that one woman differs from another." So, I mean, that's obviously. Um, a pretty angry quote, a hateful quote. So do you know how you feel about your own mom? Have you gotten in touch with that at all? Rather oh, sure, than saying, how, yeah, oh, yeah, so are you aware of how you felt like she was a prostitute and how you're mad at her and so, that she was insatiable as you could never do enough? Do you, are you aware of how you feel about all all that? Oh, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what I was talking about in terms of, Owning those feelings and taking your your filters off, you've got to know yourself. Right. And most people so be, don't know themselves. Right. So, so you know, you told in, in the book, you told a, a story about Betty, you know, who quit before you even got started. And you said, again, that proved your theory, women don't want what they say they want. But is there any other possible interpretation for why she um, walked the other way besides that? Well, I'm sure you can come up with multiple right. other uh, explanations. I know nothing about her background. I know nothing about where she came from. It's, I only took it at face value. 
Right, but your face value always returns to the same interpretation. Women don't want what they say they want. And I'm thinking that what happens when we're in the throes of our repetition compulsions, a woman who wants a relationship will smell that you aren't ready for a mutual relationship, and she'll run away to protect herself. Well, I and mean, I'm, she, didn't, she didn't really know anything about me. It's, but We know. On, we know yeah. within 60 seconds we get a whole download. That's what's so amazing. That's how, how do people who choose abusive partners do it again and again? They say our unconscious registers within 60 seconds. Everything we need to know. And see, I and, would disagree with that because uh-huh. she and I, for probably, I don't, don't remember exactly, four to six weeks, you know, had discussions over the phone and really were getting to know each other from that sort of a level. Uh, it was only when we were going to be in in each other's presence that she flaked out. And mm-hmm. again, I didn't get into her background. I didn't mm-hmm. get into her childhood. I didn't do anything like that because I figured that's not that's not appropriate over the mm-hmm. phone, or at least it's, that's not one avenue that's the best way to explore that. But mm-hmm. it was when that we were actually going to spend FaceTime together that she, as, as I say, flaked out but basically didn't want to get into it. Right. What I'm telling you is that we sense, we sense what people are ready for and not ready for. And, and also for you, you know, when you keep picking women who prove to you that they can't be satisfied, they're just whores, they're prostitutes, when you feel that way, you wouldn't even draw a woman who'd be happy with what you give. That kind of a woman wouldn't appeal to you because you're still trying to work out something from before. It's kind of the ghost and the haunting of the past. You know, you know, I, I said to you, I was married for 30 years. My husband, gave me everything I asked for, and I was thrilled with everything he gave me. And you should be having the same thing. You deserve that. Somebody who is appreciative of you, how hard you work, how much you do, how educated you are, that's the kind of woman you should be with. Well, I wouldn't argue that. And mm-hmm. you know, that, that is, you know, more justifying myself. And let me tell you, I am... I am a big believer in a Freudian analysis. In fact, I talk about that in the book. Mm-hmm. I'm a believer in childhood traumas. Um, I just think that it, it was not I, – well, let's put it out back up. Uh, I'm not sure what she was sensing, but she was not sensing that I wasn't ready for a relationship. I don't know what she was sensing, but that's not it. Chester, do you have a thought about what I'm speaking about? Are you there? Yeah, yes, uh, Doctor. I, I do. I do get what you're saying. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, Doctor Rawlings is is um, uh, doesn't see it that way. I, mm-hmm. I think that he's putting it on her. Mm-hmm. To me, it sounds like well, it sounds like more of the same. It's her. It's what she's doing. Uh, mm-hmm. Him. Um, I, I had a had a question that I, I don't think. Um, that I've heard much about what uh, it from from Dr. Rowling. Maybe it's a little diversion, but I mean, I still feel like asking it. Which is like, what is it when you were talking to this woman on the phone? What what is it you were interested in? What what is it that you liked about her? Why did you want her in your life? What what was it about her? Sure, I, I mean, mean that's a that's a very you know worthwhile question because that's part of what you're exploring. Um, she ran. She dove. She was athletic. She had a good business sense. Uh, she was. Um, no, no, no. I, I'm not asking really about what her, you know, like what you would write on a form if you were going on the internet and filling out a form to see if somebody, like a job qualification. I'm not looking for that. I'm kind of looking for more of what, what is it that gets you in your gut about this woman? What is it that, why do you, would you, I mean, would you, could you see yourself running into a burning building for her? I mean, where is the, the, where is the, where is the, what do you call it, the, where are the hormones? I mean, wh- the, what's the passion, it? where's the passion? Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks, thanks. Okay, well, see, the what, thing what is, is the I, had, I had never met this woman, so. She was a stranger. And so I'm not sure that I can tell you that that she would have triggered me running into a burning building. We're well, what, talking, was it, what is it that, I mean, was I mean, it, I wanted to meet a person that you're you're really looking for? I mean, I know you know people play play lacrosse and run their business, but what is it in the what qualities of a woman is it that you would give your life for? 
Oh, okay. Um, yeah. I, I, I get what you're saying now. Yeah, yeah. I know you but don't. because you can't get that over the phone, and that's why I was disappointed that we didn't meet. No. Um, you no, know, what what he's saying is, you know, when you talk about like the qualities of a soul, what yeah. are you looking for? Are you looking for a woman who will be satisfied with you, who will say you're my everything, or are you looking for a woman who's never satisfied? You know, what are you looking for in your heart and soul? And obviously, what you say you want consciously, it doesn't always match up with what we want unconsciously. But what is it that you think you want. That's what I think you're asking, Chester, right? Is that true? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, that is what I'm asking for. Well, yeah, yeah she, he's, she's twisted it just a little bit. That's, I always that's, do. That's my, I, know, I, I just, I know. That's fine, because I know what you're, where you're coming from. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'll answer that the way I answer myself a lot of times. I'm, I'm almost always happy. I'm always grateful for what I have, but I'm not saying that I'm content. I think you should always be striving to reach something better. And I'm not talking about a better, you know, a, I'm talking about in yourself, like a better communication skills or a better photograph or better art. It's just I'm always happy, but I'm not always content. But and now you're a, saying, are you saying that you're not satisfied? You aren't. Oh, with my, I'm, I expect myself to grow personally, absolutely. But there's a difference between saying I always want to grow versus I'm not happy with myself. I'm not I, satisfied. I didn't, no, no, no. Remember, okay. remember I said, I said I'm always happy with myself. Okay. I'm always happy and grateful, but I think you can grow and I'm oh, not yeah. content to stagnate. Oh, I'm right. not always happy with myself. <laughs> you don't think, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can understand that, but I mean, you give yourself a break. You're not down on yourself, are you? Uh, I'm sorry. Are you speaking to me? Yeah, yes. he's asking Palmer? you. Do you are yeah. you ever down on yourself? Huh? <laughs> if you knows? live in the I human mean, body, I, I, who knows? I, I just know one thing is that when I'm when I'm not one thing, I, I just know that when it comes to romance, I can focus on myself or I can focus on on the other person, and and I, I, I would prefer to open myself to the incoming and and make myself uh, to. I, I need to. I try. I try to. I do actually drop my my shields, like on Star Trek, and and I I am ready for a a full frontal assault or or whatever it is, in the hope and possibility that I will find somebody who is gentle, someone who's kind, someone who is uh, has sweetness for me and other people, someone who treats animals well. I mean, it, it, there are so many things that melt my heart. That has nothing to do with lacrosse and running a business well. Mm-hmm. Uh, you see what I'm saying? I, I just can't. I just can't operate on the mercantile uh, level that you're talking about. I, I I would be so empty. I wouldn't want to live. I wouldn't want to live that way. Chess, do you see yourself it's as worth a it. giver? Huh? You see yourself as a giver or a taker? Neither. It's you see, you look at things in black and white terms, right? I'm it's not. not well, it's not either I'm not or. A negotiator, and I'm not. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to win anything, and I'm not trying to coerce anything. It's, it's not quid pro quo with me. If you are you and I am I, and perhaps we go together and perhaps there's something, but if, when I find someone whose candle burns and I light my wick from hers, my candle burns. It burns forever. And you're not only talking about dipping your wick either, Chester. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the that's one of the real joys of listening to the show. <laughs> I I'm love just... this show. It's so funny. You, Dr. Turndorf, you are really <laughs> fans, hilarious. I got to tell you, I, you, you learn a lot by listening to this show. But it's also really funny. I've got, uh, I don't know if Dr. Rawlings, if you if you've listened to the show before, I have numerous times. It's really a gas. Really, you need a gas mask. Really, <laughs> so. So, you know, I love I love what you say in the end of your book. You say, to have a soul that's fully alive is our purpose. I love that. And you say, by understanding ourselves and having no fear, we're free to see others in a better light. And this translates into unconditional acceptance. Now, I really like that. I like what you're saying there. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, because, you know, you feel like, did I, did I really work you over? Did you? No, I mean, because I've, I've confronted the issues that you've, Discussed. I have done that before. Yeah, um, been there, please done please that. forgive me, doctors. I have to. I have to go back to work. 
Uh, I thank you for a, a lovely lunch break. And, uh, <laughs> Thanks for calling in. I will, I will get copies of both of your books and read them uh, mm -hmm. from first to last page. Thank you so much for the show. Thanks for, for joining us. So, Thanks, you know, I, I also agree that really – the, the purpose is to invo to resolve our internal blocks, to fully loving ourselves and others. And you said in your book, life truly starts when you reach the end of your comfort zone. And I'll take that a step farther and say it starts when you leave the trauma of your past behind so that you're really free to fully live and love in the now and find a partner who will not repeat for you the the desperation and the despair and the dissatisfaction of your early life and that just opens up the well for you of possibilities of love and i really hope for you that this person you're dating now offers you that oasis of love and that you feel fully satisfied in that she satisfies you so thank you for joining me dr rawlings your book um it really is that complicated and i'll see you all next week on ask dr love radio bye-bye